Well, welcome, human biology class. Hey, you know this uh, social distancing thing. It's uh, it's it's really kind of interesting. Different people's takes on it. I was listening to a couple of Norwegian guys yesterday, Sven and Oli, and they were uh, they were uh, Sven says to Oli, he says, you know, Oli, we're supposed to keep. Uh, I hear we're supposed to keep a social distance of six feet, and uh, Oli says to Sven, he says, geez, that's kind of close. A little Norwegian humor there for you. Anyway, um, today we're going to switch to the urinary system. Um, but uh, first I wanted to uh, do a little throwback to the um, immune system. Uh, I wanted to show you um, a clip of a, of a gentleman that has another type of immunodeficiency. We talked last time about AIDS, which is the human uh, comes which which comes from uh, the human HIV, the human immunodeficiency virus. That virus produces AIDS, which is AIDS, which is acquired immune deficiency syndrome. Okay. Well, here's another immunodeficiency. Um, the uh, human papillomavirus, HPV virus, th there are many, many forms of it. And uh, we will all uh, 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 come in contact with forms when we played in the dirt, maybe scuffed our, our, our hands or shins or something like that. And our, our bodies are, are very able to produce, to, to fight off that particular type of HPV virus. But I'm going to introduce you to uh, Dede Kosuera. He's a gentleman from Indonesia, and uh, he was born with an immunodeficiency that made him incapable of warding off this particular HPV strain, which has the effect of producing warts uh, in people. And, uh, well, without further ado, here's Dede. In a remote part of Indonesia, living in a dense jungle village, is a man who looks half man, half tree. 36-year-old Dede lives with a mystery disease that has encased his body with branch-like structures. His hands and feet span up to just under a meter, growing five centimeters a year. Now an American doctor is traveling to Indonesia in a desperate search for a diagnosis and even a cure. This will be a jaw dropper for the dermatology community throughout the United States and really worldwide. This is a very unusual and impressive case. As a single father to his two children, Dede struggles to provide for them. His only income is to perform circus stunts with a bizarre collection of people. But with each new event, the mysterious disease worsens. Soon it will cover his whole body, risking his chance of death unless help can be found. Okay, that's a, a shocking look at a gentleman with a human with an immunodeficiency that uh, renders him incapable of warding off a, a virus that produces warts. Well, here's an update on Day Day. And the two kids. But what caused those mysterious warts? Believe it or not, a rare genetic defect that prevented him from fighting off. The HPV virus, human papillomavirus, 2008, three men underwent surgery to have over four pounds of the roach removed from his body, and since then, he's been able to regain partial use of his hands. Uh, again, fascinating story. I know you're doing a double take here at home. Uh, and joining us talking. That is um, a look at Day Day and an update on him. Um, uh, unfortunately, I have a further update. Um, so he was able to um, um, have a number of warts removed, and you can see in the picture here um, that he um, had them removed, not just from his hands, but from his face and his scalp, his feet as well. It did restore uh, some function for him, but um, it didn't address the underlying issue of uh, his inability to fight off that virus. And unfortunately, it came back. Um, I think a couple of times he had a couple of surgeries or maybe even more. Uh, but in the in the end, um, he just uh, kind of was was tired of fighting it and and actually passed away in 2016 uh, of this condition, which is kind of a sad thing. But it's it's a look at another type of an immunodeficiency and and how thankful we should be when our bodies do function well and we don't have to deal with uh, something like day day did. Well, that's a look at um, uh, the, uh, another um, immunodeficiency. 
And we're going to shift gears now, and we're going to talk about the urinary system. Sorry, I had a little recorder glitch there. Um, anyway, the urinary system. So um, if you look at the image here, um, this is of some of the main components of the urinary system. We want to think about what it does, its main functions. So the urinary system um, has, well, four listed functions there, just to elaborate on a few of them. It's to get rid of, number one, to get rid of cell wastes. These are mainly nitrogen-containing wastes or nitrogenous wastes. The main three listed in order of occurrence in your urine, in other words, urea being the, the most common constituent of urine, uric acid, and then creatinine. Uh, yes, that is spelled correctly. Creatinine is a waste product that is produced from creatine or uh, creatine phosphate. Uh, we'll talk about that when we get to bones. Uh, but uh, those of you that are to muscles, I'm sorry, um, those of you that are uh, into bodybuilding or know somebody that has knows that they are likely or you are likely to be consuming a, a creatine supplement. Well, it's related. This is a waste product that is in urine that comes from that. Um, the kidneys uh, also uh, are there. The urinary system is also there to regulate water and salt levels. Uh, we looked at, already at an example of your body's inability to um, sorry folks, I'm again having some troubles with this recorder. I'll try to do better. Um, this is uh, edema, which we looked at in the circulatory system. It um, is created as, um, well, there's a number of ways when your, your heart isn't pumping blood fast enough to remove additional fluid from the tissues, commonly those tissues that are most distant from the heart, like your legs and your hands. Fluid can build up. It can also be there because the heart pumps too hard and blood pressure is too high. But at any rate, uh, we can get fluid buildup. It's the kidney's job also to regulate and prevent this. Interestingly enough, um, for, vo for those people that have a heart condition that causes edema, like you see here, um, the um, the, the, the cure or the cure, the treatment for it is commonly a medication that affects the kidney. So you've got a heart condition and medication affects the kidney to get it to pull more water out of the blood basically and, and reduce or prevent edema from occurring. So um, that's, that's a look uh, at uh, uh, something that we've already talked about and, and related to the job of the kidney. There's also this uh, regulation of salt levels. Um, this is that generic term salt. Um, so your blood, if you look at this image here, your blood, this is the aorta here. And you notice the kidneys are the last major organ that branch off the aorta. Uh, well, the bladder's down here, but the kidneys are receiving dirty blood from the aorta. All the other organs have uh, gotten their crack at it. And uh, it's the, the, the blood has, you know, once it goes past the kidneys, um, out in the tissues, it's going to go through the capillaries, into the veins, it's going to be dirty blood then, it's going to go back to the heart, out to the lungs, all around the body, it's not going to get cleaned up again until it gets back here to the kidney. So oftentimes we think about the aorta as carrying this pure, clean, fine, oxygen-rich blood. Well, you know, it, it is after the kidneys, but before the kidneys, it's kind of dirty blood, and the kidney's job is to clean that up. And, and, and so in blood, there are, there are salts. Um, there are salts that you want to keep in your body, and there are salts that you want to put in urine. And your kidney's job is to sort those two out. Your kidney's job, your urinary system's job is also maintain blood pH. We talked about you need to keep a blood pH between 7.35 and 7.45. And uh, if you uh, go outside of those two pH ranges, then you are likely to experience fainting or convulsion, uh, coma, death. Yeah, bad stuff. So your, your kidneys keep the blood where it should be pH-wise. Uh, keeps your blood volume and your blood pressure where they should be. Those two are related. If you push more fluid through the same size tube, you will increase the pressure in the system. If you push less fluid through the same size system, the same size tube, you will decrease the pressure in the system. So your kidney is the main organ that regulates that blood volume and blood pressure. The kidney also produces hormones. Calcitriol, we already, I already alluded to that one. Uh, we talked about the importance of sunlight 
converting a kind of cholesterol in your skin to vitamin D, which your liver then converts to calcitriol, which regulates the um, uh, 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 availability of calcium in your body for all the things that it does. Think about calcium, important in heart in heartbeat, important in blood clotting. It's going to be important in bones. We know that. So there's lots of lots of things that calcium is important for. Its availability is controlled by a hormone produced by the kidney. The kidney also produces EPO, erythropoietin. Uh, that was one that we talked about in the circulatory system that uh, goes to the bone marrow and stimulates bone marrow to produce more red blood cells if your body needs them. Um, also, renin. Uh, renin is a hormone. We'll talk a little bit more about another lecture, but it helps regulate or maintain uh, blood pressure. So then if we look um, at um, the notes again, the liver produces those, those main things. Urea is the most common thing that you find in, in, your, in urine, and um, it, it comes out from the breakdown of amino acids, um, which are the main building block for proteins, if you remember. Um, Creatinine is another uh, main element of urine, and that comes from muscles, from uh, creatine phosphate and the use of it uh, to provide phosphate to uh, produce more ATP in the muscles. We'll talk about that again when we get to muscles. Anyway, bottom line is there's a waste product from that production of ATP, and it is creatinine, and that is another main constituent of urine. Uh, uric acid is the last one, uh, also a main constituent of urine, and it comes from the breakdown of nucleic acids, uh, mainly RNA. Um, there is a disease uh, a condition called gout, and if we look at gout, um, this... Sorry folks, every time I switch certain sc screens, uh, my recorder stops, so hopefully we'll muddle through that. This is a picture of gout, an inflamed uh, big toe joint, common condition, common uh, 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 look at what gout looks like. Yeah, if you, if you Google gout, you, gout, you'll see a lot more nasty uh, uh, looks at it. It can get a lot worse than this. Um, inside the joint, if we look at that right here, uh, there are crystals of uric acid building up. Um, uh, one of the first uh, um, um, medical investigations, um, real medical investigations, I think back in the 1700s, uh, uh, undertook an investigation of gout and uh, with uh, primitive microscopy at the time, they could actually see uric acid, acid crystals here. Um, this, this has been called the um, disease of affluence or disease of kings because it is associated, can be associated with diet, uh, diets high in seafood, um, what were some other things, beer, <laughs> um, um, rich meats um, can cause more uric acid uh, uh, crystals to build up. And so this was a disease more commonly seen in the affluent in, in royalty and it became known for that. But nowadays it's common uh, uh, in lots more places. And uh, it's uh, kind of uh, was a big deal because uh, one artist put together a picture that kind of captures what it feels like to have gout. And I can kind of get a kick out of that little little beastie just chewing away. And it's evidently a very painful condition um, if you know people that have had it. Anyway, gout uh, is just that, crystals of uric acid. They're not getting um, completely uh, excreted in the urine. They build up in joints distant from the heart and, uh, and produce, produce gout. So the kidney also, the kidney's main job then, as I said, is to remove waste but keep water, uh, salts, and nutrients. And again, the generic term salts for lots of different things. Um, and so the kidneys, uh, the renal arteries, as I said, if I go back to that other image and hopefully that it doesn't... Um, stop my recording, and it did. Sorry about that, folks. I'll keep working on fixing that. Um, anyway, um, renal arteries right here, bringing uh, dirty blood to the kidneys, renal veins carrying clean blood away from the kidneys, and uh, the, the veins, of course, carry blood back to the heart. And, and so, yeah, that's what we're looking at. Uh, okay, we're going to try switching gears again here. We'll see how this goes. Um, if we look at the kidney, it's 
sorry folks, I'm still doing it, I haven't figured it out yet. So if we look at the kidney here, here's a cross section of a kidney. When we do the pig dissection, um, that uh, I, I will um, make sure to um, highlight um, these aspects. But this is an actual look at the kidney. And um, if you look at it, there are sort of three main divisions. There's this outer portion, which has the name, the same name as the brain. This is the cortex. The outer region of the brain is a cortex. The outer region of the kidney is the cortex. Um, these uh, darker red structures here are called renal pyramids, and they make up um, the, the renal um, um, medulla. Okay, right here. And then this grisly looking structure here is the renal pelvis, where urine is actually gathered. So in an artist's rendition of that, here we have the cortex, here we have the medulla, and here we have the renal pelvis. So what's been done in your textbook here is this portion has been sort of blown up to right here, and, and we want to look closer at it because here we can start to see the actual functional unit of uh, of the kidney. So right here, um, if you look closely at it, now this is much larger than it would be in reality. We have a structure called the nephron. So right here, this would be one nephron. I'm trying to trace it with the cursor. Hopefully that works. Uh, one nephron. In reality, you have about a million of those per kidney. And so you've got a lot more of them than this, this shows on here. Um, so then if we look at uh, another image of a nephron, so if we look at another image of a nephron here, um, here we can see um, how it would exist in the kidney. If we look at the way it is commonly represented, um, it's represented like this. Okay. Now, I want you to realize this is a nephron that has been unfolded. This portion here would normally be folded up against this portion here. Um, and it would, it would be like this. This is what you're seeing right here. This is how it would occur in the kidney. Um, in most images, this portion has been folded away over here so we can kind of track what's going on. But in reality, this is how that, this is how that would actually look. So this is a nephron. And um, right here, you have a very unique structure. This is called the Bowman's capsule. And you can kind of see there's a portion right here, the outer portion, that's the capsule. And it surrounds this unique capillary bed right here. And it's unique because it's not like other capillary beds where you have an arterial bringing blood in and a venule bringing blood out. This is just a capillary stuck in the middle of an artery. So here's an afferent, afferent arterial, that means to carry two. Uh, here's the capillary bed, and here's the efferent arterial, it's carrying blood away. What I want you to notice is this artery right here, it continues to completely wrap around the, um, the, the rest of the nephron. And the point is that as blood comes in here and it goes through this capillary, capillary bed here, um, things are going to come out of the blood. Things that we want out of the blood and things that we don't want out of the blood. As, as, as you look at the flow, it continues along the nephron here. The job of the nephron is going to be return to the bloodstream right here, this red capillary that's, that surrounds the nephron, return into the bloodstream what your body wants, and to keep in the nephron what your body does not want. It wants to excrete in urine, okay? So that's an important thing to remember. So uh, let's look, to finish up today, let's look a little more closely at this structure right here, um, the, uh, the Bowman's capsule and the um, structure, this unique capillary bed here is called a glomerulus, okay? So if we look a little more closely at that, well, we can actually see here there's something uh, covering those capillaries there. And I have an electron micrograph image of, of what that is. Here, here's a little bit closer look. This is the Bowman's capsule. Okay, Here's the blood, blood supply. Here's blood flowing in, the afferent arterial, going all through these capillaries. And it comes back out, the efferent arterial, still arterial blood. Okay, so as it enters right here at this specialized cap, uh, capillary bed called the glomerulus, um, it's, it's like a sieve. And, and what's in the bloodstream can easily get out into the Bowman's capsule. But, but your body, remember, wants to keep um, certain things in, wants to keep blood cells in.
And so there's a filtration system here. It wants to keep um, hormones in, like the sex hormones, like um, thyroxine. Remember uh, alpha and beta um, uh, 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 globulins uh, actually attach to those proteins, and that combination of the globulin and the protein makes them too big to get through this filtration mechanism. Let's look at that filtration mechanism. Um, there are these specialized cells. I think it shows up a little better in black and white. Color's neat, but black and white gives you a little more resolution, a little more detail. There are these specialized cells here that fit together, and when somebody first looked at these, they thought, hey, those look like toes, one fitting right into another. And it makes a mesh, a, a filter, a sieve, if you will. So this is covering an arterial, the part of that glomerulus right here, a capillary, I should say, that's, that's covering it. And so fluid is coming out of that, that capillary, but these keep the big molecules in the capillary and only let the little molecules out. Now, somebody looked at those and they thought, hey, those look kind of like toes on feet. And if you've ever gone to the foot doctor, you call the foot doctor the podiatrist. Well, they called these cells then podocytes because they thought they looked like feet and toes. Okay. So what they are doing then is creating a covering on the capillary that, that acts like a filter that keeps um, big molecules in the blood and lets small molecules out. To go back to this image right here, okay, right here, this is the Bowman's capsule. So here are those podocytes, now a little bit bigger image here. So blood comes in. Um, this capillary bed is very um, uh, uh, porous, if you will. And so lots wants to come out of the bloodstream. Podocytes keep blood cells and um, um um, big uh, proteins that are connected to uh, globulins and, and big, big molecules in here. Sugars uh, that are connected together um, can be big enough to keep in there. Um, and so, but smaller molecules leak out and are captured by this Bowman's capsule here. Okay, and um, and so then uh, the the job then as as this filtered material, so the fil the, the blood stays in here and the big molecules, um, what's, what's leaked out, if you will, goes down this tube right here, and, uh, and then as I say, the, the, the job of the rest of the nephron is to return to the bloodstream what your body wants and to keep in the urine stream what your body does not want. So um, if you can see this here, this, this is porous, but it also depends on, on blood pressure. And this is uh, related to that Corey Stringer example. If you don't have enough pressure in the system here, blood is not going to be forced out of this capillary bed and into the Bowman's capsule, which means wastes will build up in the bloodstream and will begin to negatively affect the body fairly quickly. So maintaining blood pressure is important to kidney function. How do you main maintain blood pressure? By maintaining blood volume and by keeping a good, strong heart. So the kidney, as I've already mentioned, is involved with maintaining blood volume, but, but uh, it's, it's interrelated with um, all the other organs in the body. Your, even your large intestine. Your large intestine is responsible for returning water to the blood, blood, to the blood supply. That water in your blood makes more blood volume, and so you have uh, more blood pressure. Okay, so um, the kidney then, to do that, produces the chemical renin. And uh, renin causes um, capillaries, mainly this afferent uh, arterial, uh, but others, to constrict. And, and when you make a tube constrict, you're making it smaller. So now if you think about how this is going to work, if you're pushing the same amount of, uh, if you're pushing uh, the same amount of blood through a smaller tube, you will increase the pressure in the system. I'll say that again. If you're pushing the same amount of blood, so your heart's working the same, pushing the same amount of blood through a smaller tube, now we've made the tube smaller, we've vasoconstricted it, same amount of blood through a smaller tube, you will increase the pressure in the system. Increasing the pressure in the system might be desirable to keep stuff coming out of this glomerulus and into the Bowman's capsule. That's what Corey Stringer's body was no longer able to do because so much of his blood, so much volume of blood, had been diverted out to his skin's surface, his body surface, to shed that heat.
that internal blood pressure wasn't sufficient to keep the kidneys working and toxins built up in the blood and then shortly his liver failed and he died. Um, you can recover from kidney failure to a degree. Liver failure is a harder issue to recover from quickly. So renin um, causes capillaries to constrict and increases blood pressure. The last thing that it also does, this may, may seem strange, is that it makes us thirsty. It actually has an effect on, uh, on our brain which uh, regulates thirst. And so if you think about it though, that may make, that may make sense because if you drink water, uh, it's going to quickly in your stomach get into your bloodstream and that will increase the blood volume and that will increase blood pressure. So all in all, <clears throat> excuse me, if you, if you look at the one million kid, uh, nephron that each kidney has, um, let's see if this will work here. Sorry, folks. Um, if you look at the one million nephron that each kidney, kidney has, and you've got two kidneys, um, then um, uh, if, you, if you accumulate all the volume of, of fluid that they pull out of the bloodstream on a daily basis, it would just about fill one of these 55-gallon drums. It's about 50 gallons, so up to about there. So in other words, you would have to drink that much fluid and eat that much you know, replacement uh, organic molecules on a daily basis uh, if we stopped the story there. If, if we only looked at what um, the, the kidneys um, uh, produce on a daily basis, it would be a bad deal. So obviously there's more to the story than that. So cumulatively, 50 gallons of fluid comes out of the 2 million nephron right here, starts down this tube, and that's where the rest of the story will be told. Uh, just to just to sort of get you set up, this is this tube is called the proximal convoluted tubule. <laughs> wow, how about that for a for a title? Well, um, proximal and distal are two terms that um, I'm going to introduce to you now that will come up later. Um, they refer to uh, anatomical um, position. Uh, proximal means nearer to an attachment point. Distal means distant from an attachment point. And the attachment point would be right here. Convoluted means twisted. And this is uh, a tube. Okay? So proximal convoluted tubule, all that means is the near twisted tube or the close twisted tube. And uh, if we look at why it's called that, well, here's that tube. It's pretty twisted. And uh, that's where we're going to... Uh, pick things up next time. We're going to look at the proximal convoluted tubule and its role in getting good stuff back into the bloodstream and keeping the bad stuff in the urine stream. Thank you, and I'll try to have my glitches worked out by next time. Have a good day.